In this video, we are going to cover some simple tips and tricks for blueprints, such as functions and macro libraries, using a timer instead of a tick, changing the actor's tick, event graph shortcuts, and multiple event graphs. So let's get right into this. So the first thing is function macro libraries. So let's say we have our actor here and we need to do something with it. We could do something as simple as maybe getting the player controller or actually we're going to get the player character and then we're going to cast to our third person character and then maybe we need to get the uh, root for example we'll get the root component so we're going to do this for some reason maybe we need to go ahead and move this around maybe we need to we, we need to do this now i'm going to go ahead and convert this to pure cast and we now we have this little set of three nodes. Now we might want to turn this into a function. So let's say we do this often enough in our actor where we want to make it into a function or a macro. And that'll be nice because we can reuse it whenever we want inside of this blueprint. However, let's say we want to do this inside of other blueprints. We have our user interface that wants the health value. We have the game mode that may want the health value. We have enemies that may want the health value. So we have multiple things accessing the same information and that information is, you know, it's only a few nodes, but it would be helpful to make a shortcut to it. Well, that is what function and macro libraries are for. If we do blueprints, we have the function library and the macro library. I have a function library created here. And all this is is basically functions that have that are not restricted to a single blueprint. So we could, for example, go in here, grab this information. We could go to our function library and put it into here and we'll go with our new function it's going to output something in this case we're going to output our you know character root the output is going to be a scene component so we'll go ahead and find our scene component and it's a reference like this and that'll be our output now if we ever needed this we could always name this properly so this will be like get character root is what we're going to call it now if I'm inside of something that needs this, I can always right click and get character root and we'll find it under my blueprint function library. And there's my node to give me my character root. Now it's called my blueprint function library because that's what I named it. You can always add in subs as well. Now one thing that's nice is because this function is only going to return back data that will not be modified inside of the function, I can make it pure. So if we make it pure, that means basically nothing's going to change and it's going to change my output into a pure node. I don't need to execute it. So this one node now compromises these three nodes and I can do it from anywhere. You can also do that with macro libraries. The biggest difference with a macro library is when you create a macro library, it asks you for the parent. Macro libraries will only work with that parent. So for example, if I'm inside of here, I have new macro library. We have a generic function called um, generic macro, for example. We go into our actor and we type in generic macro. We'll find it under utilities generic macro. But if I go into like my player controller, type in generic macro, it's not gonna work properly because I've got it set up as an actor for the parent class. Now. Technically, player controllers derive from actors, but if you want to make things restricted, for example, you only want macros running inside of specific classes, like maybe macro specific to an enemy, macro specific to a character, it could allow you to easily separate things by making sure their parent class is correct. So our next thing is gonna be using timers instead of a tick. The tick or the event tick is fired off every frame. Every frame we're going to get this event firing and we're going to do something. Now if you're doing something simple, using a tick is not bad. It's fine. It's perfectly acceptable. The engine uses ticks all the time to do things that are supposed to happen every frame. But if you're doing something more intensive, let's say maybe indexing all the characters in the scene or you know you're doing something that doesn't necessarily need to check every time, well, you can just set it up as a timer instead. So instead of using the tick, just do an event um, uh, set timer by function or event name and run a timer instead 
at whatever interval. So, you know, every tenth of a second, we can go ahead and run off whatever we were going to run inside of an event. It's an easy way to have roughly the same thing. You're, I mean, a tenth of a second is pretty good. That's going to check roughly every 10 seconds. Now, this might check 60 times a second or 100 times or 200. But if you're checking something simple, like maybe making sure there's still a target for your enemy, might not need to do it every tick. Do it every tenth of a second and reduce the amount of load. Now, the nice thing about this is, let's say you want to use the tick and you didn't necessarily want to actually check every tick, as weird as that sounds. Well, this is how you can set the actor tick. So actors actually can have their tick event changed. They can change the time at which it ticks. We pull up the settings, oh, class defaults, there we go. And we look for actor tick, we can find the tick interval. By default it's zero, that means every time the global tick happens, this individual actor will tick out. So for example, we could do print string, and we'll go ahead and uh, we'll do a, um, no, you know, we'll just print string hello. Why not? It's easy enough. Drop it in the scene, hit play, and you'll notice we're going to be spammed with hello. Now, if we were to go in here and we were to grab our tick interval, let's change it to two, for example, and hit play. Well, you'll notice we didn't change any of the code. Um, it would probably help if I changed our duration to longer than two. Let's go with like 10 so we can actually see it. There we go. We didn't change any of our code. We're still using the event tick. However, it's only going to fire every two seconds. So this is a way you could technically have something that's going to tick, not have to modify any code, not to have to use anything special like the timers, but still change the actual time that's going to tick at. So you could think of it as something as, oh, I want this item to do something every second. Just change its tick to a second, and it's going to try as best as it can to fire off every second. Now, you can change the tick information inside of your blueprint. There's a way to change things. You can turn on and off the tick and things like that. You can't change the... No, you can't. Interval. Never mind. Um, yeah, here we go. Well, that's the get interval. Let's see. Set tick. Yeah, there we go. Set actor tick interval. So you can actually change the tick interval at runtime as well. I thought we could. So not only can we adjust it at design time, you could technically have your system adjust itself automatically without having to really screw up any code. Set up your tick, set it up for, oh, I don't know, we're going to start off at 10 seconds, uh, 5 seconds, for example. And then you could have every time it ticks, maybe it reduces the global tick by half a second not the global, sorry, the actor tick by half a second. And then you could have the item, let's change this back to 10, there we go. You could do something like that. You could do something like every time it ticks, we will get the actor tick interval. Uh, if I can, interval, seriously? Yeah, I have to pull, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was just because I was trying to pull off an execute node and it didn't have an execute, so that didn't help. So you could do something like this. And you could have this thing basically count down. And you could do something like that and that and that and set. Then maybe you do something like this. Get it the interval. If it's less than or equal to something like zero. If. And then we could do like a destroy. Uh, if I can actually hook up the destroy. So this is basically something that could be spawned into the world and it's going to tick after our initial tick, so 10 seconds. After that first time it ticks, it's going to subtract half a second and now the next time it'll be nine and a half seconds. And it's going to repeat by dropping half a second off until it gets to nothing basically and then destroy itself. So you could think of this as kind of like a bomb that is counting down faster and faster and faster until it finally gives up. So it's a nice easy way of using the tick, but not having it actually fire off on the global tick. So let's say we are playing around now and we kind of want, we're lost. We're lost in our graph. We don't know where we're at. We have multiple events and we're kind of lost. Well, there's a few easy ways to find your work. If we use the home key on your keyboard, it will focus in on your general overall graph if you have nothing selected. So like we could be over here, 
hit the home key, and it's going to give it this. Let's say you want to target something specific. You can target it, and then you can hit the home key, and it will target just the individual node. Let's say you have multiple things, and you want to find one thing in particular, multiple events on your graph. So let's go ahead and pull up, for example, our player here. And our player has multiple things on this graph. We can actually find it all here. And let's say we're over here and we hit the home key. Well, that kind of doesn't help. Well, on the left or anywhere you have it under your blueprint, you have your event graph. And this actually lists all of your events. Down here, it will list all of your functions. And you can double click on any event to have it focus. So we can instantly find any of our events, no matter where they're at, or any of our functions, no matter where they're at. Let's say that's still not enough. Let's say you've got something like this and it's a giant mess. And you're like, well, this is getting a little bit much for me. Well, we have multiple event graphs. If you look over here under event graph, this is your default one. However, you can always just do new graph and have a new graph. Like for example, we can call this one our input graph. We could go back into our event graph. Let's grab all of our input and let's put it into our input graph and then go back to the event graph. And now it's a little bit tidier. So we could have one graph for input, one graph for functions related to certain events, one graph related to other things, and you can organize them into their own graphs and easily again go back and forth and you'll jump between graphs as needed as well. So that's it. That's just a few quick tips and tricks for getting the best out of your blueprints. Hopefully some of these will be useful.